And amen. Wow, you sound great today. And it's so good to see you. Um, we have freed up some seats. If you see the kiddos, some parents leaving, uh, we have worship explorers that take place uh, here. Kids that are uh, young enough to come in, but I don't know, not old, not old enough to hear the sermon. I'm not sure what that, what that means, but uh, some of you adults start roaming out. We'll know something's up. But hey, um, Kerry mentioned, uh, before I dive in, he mentioned the, you know, the bulletin here. Now, we give you this every week. And it's possible to kind of just buzz through it, but I want you to really pay attention when you receive this. It's for a purpose. Uh, we have here lots of information uh, on Easter that's coming up. We're now in the Easter season officially. We had our Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday, and we talked about the Passover because uh, we kind of jumped right across that in this series of messages that we're doing. We tied it to the Lord's Supper we shared together. But you can see that, you know, some churches gather. If you're a guest, uh, we especially, we do welcome you. We're so glad you're here. You might go to a church that kind of just meets on Sunday and maybe has small groups through the week or something like that and other ministries, certainly. But we, we're a seven day a week church, uh, frankly. This campus is being used all week long and uh, it's happening this week. I mean, we've got, you know, Tuesday, if you're in a career transition, you can find yourself here. There's a great ministry that helps you and guides you and leads you. On Wednesday nights, of course, we've got all kinds of stuff that's happening here along with our choirs and teaching, a uh, nearly wed uh, ministry that takes place. This week, there's a serve opportunity for you where you can learn about For the Nations, one of our partner ministries, and you can come and be a part of that. Thursday is kind of Bible study day. We have a men's Bible study that meets right here, and you can dive in. This coming Thursday, I'm teaching that uh, a class we're walking through together, Bible study together um, through the book of Nehemiah. We have a women's Bible study. Gosh, Friday, we've got the father-daughter banquet uh, where you dads can still dive in. Saturday, you can join me. It's at Movement Day uh, DBU this year, and we're going to gather Christians, believers from around the city to come together to face kind of the stubborn facts and challenges of our city together. So all of these things, all week long, I just want to bring your attention to that. No one can do all of this, but there's something for you. And uh, to be present matters. I was with our high school students this morning, just challenging them. There's a weekly reminder when we come together uh, that God loves us. It really is what we're doing right here and now. It's a discipline of remembrance. You see it throughout the Bible. Uh, it's what the Passover is. It's what the Lord's Supper is. It's why we gather on Sunday. You were reminded through song how much God loves you. We're reminded, oh, that's right. I'm a light. I'm, I'm to be a salt and light in my, my place, my context where God has placed me. So let me just encourage you in these days as we move towards Easter. It's going to be a beautiful time. We end this series next week. Then we dive into Easter, a uh, uh, series of messages. It takes us all the way Easter Sunday, which is April 1st this year. In the midst of that, you saw it. Uh, we've got the pulpit swap on the 18th. Lots that's happening. So, all right. So that's for you. Don't just toss it. Take it. Read it. And know what's happening. Okay? Hey, last night, um, Stacy and I watched um, a basketball game. Anybody watch a basketball game last night? Anybody? Um, I mean, there's several games on, but we, we, we were watching this game. We have, we had guests in our home. And so we, um, we, we recorded the game and, uh, we thought, well, I was thinking, well, you know, if, if our team loses, I'm not watching that. It's a waste of time. I ain't going to watch that. Um, if they win, let's watch this, you know, got to buzz through, maybe go to the second half, get on it. And sure enough, uh, I knew the score. Stacy did as well before the game, uh, you know, before we watched the game. So we're watching the game. You ever done this before? Like, you know the score, but you're watching the game. And what happens is, and we even talked about this, it was like, you know, like the other team, like this huge dunk or something or something, block a shot off into the stands or who knows what. And, you know, the, the opponent, the opposing, you know, crowd is like, yeah, you know, and we're like, meh, whatever. Yeah, you mean, whatever. Oh, oh no, one of our guys hurt. He's down. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to win, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, or, or, you know, oh, you know, five seconds left. He missed the, both foul shots. No, nah, it doesn't matter. We're going to win. And no big deal, right? Changes everything. Expectations toward the end of the game changed everything about it. When you're watching a game normally, and it's best to watch it live. But, but when you're watching a game, right, you're, if you're into it, you're like, mm, 
it's like up and down. Some people can't watch. And like sometimes you say, I can't even watch this anymore. I'm out. You know, too much for me. My heart's beating too fast. Some of you are like that. A little too crazy about your sports team, probably. Um, determine your worth uh, on how well, you know, teenagers play a game. Not, not a healthy thing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, it changes everything. You know, heart rate's low. Like, we got this. We're winning. We're going to win. This is really, and, and, and all of this to say that expectations really determine everything. And today we're going to talk about unmet expectations. Now I mentioned one of the ministries we have on Wednesday night is an incredible uh, nearly wed program or ministry. Uh, and we have a great newly wed as well ministry as you enter into marriage. And uh, what we talk about with our young couples in one of our inventories we, we take together is what's called um, idealistic distortion. You, you track it with me there? Idealistic distortion. It's a distortion of expectations entering into marriage. A lot of people think your first couple few years of marriage, the challenge is, you know, how you deal with money, and, or maybe it's infidelity, maybe it's, oh gosh, arguing all the time. And people think that marriages end as a result of those things. I could argue that marriages, the greatest challenge is unmet expectation. It's not just a marriage thing, it's a life thing. This week, you were heading off to work, perhaps. You hit some traffic that you didn't anticipate. Oh, my gosh, unmet expectations. Maybe you're in a relationship and someone has, has um, gosh, really disappointed you. Maybe you've hoped that work would fulfill some need in you, and it's just not there. Maybe you're expecting too much of certain things or people in your life. Maybe it's an illness or a disappointment. We all face... Um, unmet expectations. It's a part of life, right? You have expectations coming in here today. You're hopeful. Even now you're thinking, Jeff, I'm not even tracking with you. I was hoping you'd tell me something about how to manage my money or something. I, I was hoping you'd tell me how to, how to overcome some, you know, something else. We all have expectations. And if you don't learn how to manage, even prevail in the midst of unmet expectations, it'll lead to a life of frustration. And today we're going to see how God uses our unmet expectations for his purpose. In fact, he's going to help us see that he provides for us in different ways, and that should lead us to a life of obedience. So I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to talk about expectations, frustrations that come often, God's deliverance, and then our obedience. All right, Exodus 16. Now, this is kind of a famous story that you may know. This is where God provides manna for the people in the wilderness. Now, let me place this back into context. At the end of Exodus chapter 15, um, it picks up where we left off last week. If you were here with us, um, we ended by singing the song of Moses, the first song in the Bible. Moses wrote this song. He also wrote Psalm 91 and perhaps some other psalms that we find. So he was like this renaissance man, right? And, uh, and so he writes this song and they're singing, celebrating, because they have, they've been rescued from slavery in Egypt. Uh, you could say that that was their salvation. That's the great salvific story of the Old Testament. Uh, and, and, and they're rescued from bondage. And now they find themselves heading to the promised land, but not yet there. So this is really... Um, the next couple of weeks is really great teaching on how do you live in the in-between? And you know, this, this eschatological, theological, already but not yet. Already rescued out, but now we're in the wilderness. And much of the Christian life looks a lot like just trudging along. If salvation is this great experience, we've got angels singing and music is playing, then, then that is our great salvation but the wilderness becomes our sanctification. The wilderness is where we learn to trust God. So that's where they are now. They're a couple of months in. We're going to see really a month and a half into the wilderness. So this is brand new stuff. At the end of chapter 15, they come to a place called Mara. And uh, they couldn't drink the water there, it says in verse 23. And, uh, and it says in verse 24, And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? So this grumbling, this complaining is going to be on repeat for a while. And right, really throughout their journey. And Moses and Aaron are putting up with a lot. They keep turning to the Lord because evidently church people grumbled back then. 
And, um, and so he really was challenged by, I mean, his leadership is constantly challenged, but he remains faithful to the Lord. And he turns to the Lord. He says, Lord, come on, tell me, remind me again. And the Lord keeps speaking into his heart. And it says that uh, then the Lord provides. They grumble and mumble. They, he ends up providing water for them at the end of chapter 15. In verse 27, it says, then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. I love that. Someone counted them. And they encamped there by the water. Now, I have the, so they have no water. God is like, I see this. He upgrades them to 70 Palms Resort is what it looks like. And they're in Las Vegas or something. They're just hanging, chilling by the springs, having a big time. But they're not where God wants them to be. Sometimes we want to stay in this place. And God says, this is not where I'm taking you. I've got a, in fact, watch this, better place for you. They don't know about this land flowing with milk and honey, not yet, but the Lord has better plans for them. They set out, chapter 16, verse 1. Let's, let's just dive in. Let me read through verses, yeah, verse 9, and we'll jump in. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. Now, this is not how we would think Sin. This is uh, Sinai is where they get the name, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So about a month and a half in. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled, here it is again, against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So look at this. This is not just the early adopters uh, or, or the laggards, I should say. This is not, this is everybody. The innovators, the laggards, the I ain't coming, the I just grumble because that's how I live. I just always, these are all the people are grumbling against him. So, I mean, he can't win for losing and it's just begun. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So he, it's almost as if, I mean, they're saying, you intentionally brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die out here. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. Now look at what God, watch, watch this. He's going to give them. He does this over and over again. Very specific instruction. Moses, here's exactly what's going to happen. Watch this. And you're going to do this. And then they're going to do this. I'm going to buy this. And then this. This is what's going to He's starting to catch this, right? After the Red Sea, after the plagues, he's starting to see God is true to his word. And so God says, here's how you're going to do this. You're going to go out every day. But on the sixth, and he says, watch, look at this, to test them. I want them to learn how to obey me. That's what this is about. And so he gives very specific instruction. Whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day... When they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Now, he hasn't explained what that's all about yet, but you may know already. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that, the Lord, that, that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Look at that. It's kind of a remembrance, this discipline of remembrance. You can remember God's the one who provides for you, and he brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. You're going to see him, his love, his character, his holiness, his providence over you, his provision, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. Now it sounds like there that he's saying, you know, you were whining and so he, he gave up, and now he's going to... Now, kids, don't follow this pattern. This is not the pattern. It's not really saying that. He, he knows what your needs are. He hears what's going on, and he's going to provide for you. And then it says, for, for uh, Moses goes on, and he says, For what are we, kind of saying, who are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? He's saying, Moses and Aaron, your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Okay, I want you to see a few things here. And I have uh, really at the beginning here, this message, um, kind of a sermon within a sermon, right? So bonus, it's bonus day, it's, you know, biggie size sermon. You get, a, you get a, a, a sermon within a sermon because I want to camp on part of this first point here. And let's talk about when God provides. First thing I want you to see is unmet expectations lead to frustration. 
Now you might say, well, logically that's going to happen. Well, that's what happens here, and it's kind of on repeat. Now, if you have um, a two-year-old at home, you know what we're talking about, the grumbling, whining, complaining. If you have a junior high student who's like a two-year-old, you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you have an adult, if you have a spouse who's like a junior high who whines like a two-year-old, you know what I'm talking about, right? So there's, some, there's going to be some, uh, there, there's some challenging moments here in, in the message because all of us at varying degrees, um, we, we meet these unexpectations, unmet expectations with frustration. And I want to talk about this. Let's talk about our frustration, how it leads to complaining, all right? Let's just talk about this a minute because let me just ask you, honestly, are you a complainer? Are you a whiner? Now, none of us want to admit that, but I think all of us are in varying degrees. If you want to know, ask someone real close to you. Do I complain a lot? Uh, do, you don't have to do it now, but um, <laughs> do I? Some of you are, is that me? I think that's me. Um, all of us complain, but think about your own life. Uh, what are you complaining about these days? What are, you, what are you whining about? I saw a post that was uh, an article someone wrote, and it was, it was entitled, Why You Hate Your Pastor. And I was like, oh, man, i got to read this. I don't, I don't want people to hate me. i got to read this. And the bottom line was, the writer was saying, because he doesn't or she doesn't do or say what you want them to. They don't, they don't have the passion for your ministry that you do. They don't, whatever, you know, it's, it's these unmet kind of expectations that can lead to frustration. And what we're going to see here is that, that complaining distorts the past. You see that in verse three, they're, they're thinking now it's pretty, we was pretty awesome being slaves. Actually, uh, we really enjoy, are you kidding me? You were slaves. You were being beaten and working all day long, but they were saying, well, at least we had food to eat. But see, when you, when you, when you complain, uh, it, it leads to this distortion of the past. There's a, a, a fascinating book um, by Lovell Levin, and it's, it's called The Fractured Republic. It is um, kind of a, a re-looking at what he calls the social construct of America and how we can move forward in this age of individualism. And he says this, the great political divide in our country today is because of this um, passion and focus on nostalgia, and it's killing us. That's the premise of kind of the book, and he goes a lot further than that, but he says this. He says all, everybody on the left is longing for the good old days of the 60s, right? Back when it was all, you know, and JFK and Camelot, all was right in the world. The conservatives all on the right just want to go back to the Reagan days. I mean, it was just like 81, we'd be fine. In fact, think about it. Um, President Trump won the election on a platform that said what? It's still, make America great again. A call back to another time, back to the past. Levin's premise is, nostalgia will kill us in the present if all we do is try to repeat something that's happened in the past because we're in a new context and a new day. So it, it, it's, it kind of strangles us. It stops us from really thinking about the present. Anything new becomes suspect. This can happen in our lives personally. It can certainly happen in a church when we, when we want to continue with a message that never changes, but we must constantly be looking at our methods in order to reach the next generation. So mission always informs change in the church and in the same way in our own lives, a, an, an unusual attachment to the past or this, this, this nostalgia for the past can really distract us. It, it, it disrupts the present. It distorts the past, but I want you to see too. Secondly, complaining diminishes the present. Um, it, I could say it magnifies the challenges of the present. I mean, they're saying, we're going to die out here. Are they really going to die? We know earlier they have livestock. They have provisions. You can eat the line. Now, they saw it probably as a source of income, for, but for whatever matter, they're not, they're not going to die. And certainly if they're going to trust the Lord, he's already telling them, come on, we're going to be okay. Moses has tried to encourage them. But you see, complaining or rejoicing in the present is a choice. It's a choice. We can complain and it, and it distorts the past. It diminishes the present. And, and what we see here in verse 7 and 8, complaining, this is, the, this is where I want to land here. Complaining, um, it really dishonors God. That's what Moses is saying here in the end. He's saying, you guys, you're complaining. You don't need to complain to us. 
you, you're dishonoring God if you don't believe that he's placed me as the deliverer, Aaron and I, over you. And we're here to tell you everything's going to be okay. In fact, they were looking to Aaron and Moses to provide for them what God alone could provide for them. That happens as well, right? When we turn to someone or some, yeah, some person in our lives and they don't come through for us. It's why it happens early on in marriage oftentimes. I thought this person was going to fill this void in me uh, and they're not. It must be that I've married the wrong person. And and people do that. How how about our leaders are the most criticized um, people. We grumble and we complain. I mean, who's the most criticized person in our nation? It's our president, right? But it it doesn't matter who's in office. Not really. It was that way with Obama. It was that way with with Bush. It was that way with Clinton. I mean, just it's always that way. Why is that? Why do we have a propensity towards complaining and murmuring, criticizing our leaders? Because we want them to be our saviors. That's why. And we want others to do the same. Some of us, we complain about our job because it's not meeting some need. We thought it'd make us happier and healthier in life. And some of us complain about, um, again, a spouse or, or a child or someone in your life. Chronic complaining will cause you to constantly distort the past as if it was better. You're going to diminish what God is doing in your life in the present. Ultimately, your complaining reveals your heart that you're not trusting the Lord, that He really does know what He's doing. It becomes most often this kind of self-obsession, a a, a self-absorption. And I want to just say this before we press on to uh, the next point. Um... Oftentimes in the church today, we see this, and this happens across the board, there's this uh, cultural Christian kind of consumerism in the church in our day, where we show up and we want it to really be all about us. A lot of people see church as this kind of provider of spiritual goods and services. So come through for me. This is about me in the end, and today's about me. And clearly we come here and say, Lord, speak to me through your word, I need encouragement in my life. I want to be reminded of how much you, you love me. I don't know if you come into worship that way. But people talk, and, and, and our conversation after church often betrays our misunderstanding or reveals it. How was worship today, we might ask. How was worship? You tell me. I mean, did, did you worship the Lord? Did you pour your heart out to him? Did you listen to his word preached? Did you seek to apply it while you were listening? Did you, did you understand the word of God? Were you passionate to know it and to, and to apply it? Did you love others who were there in the family? Did you encourage others? How about this? Did you serve others is the question some of us could ask. Are you here for yourself? Are you here to serve? And so what happens, we, we get really frustrated and we come thinking that worship even in the end is about me. Worship's not about me. Worship is about God. The church is about the bride of Christ. It's a place where we come as family and we learn and grow and then we go to serve him and to share his love with others around us. We come here for an audience of one. Come with a heart set to worship him because in the end, the solution to our complaining is trust. If you complain and murmur and grumble, In whatever area of your life, it reveals that you're not trusting the Lord. So how does God teach us to trust him? Through our unmet expectations that lead to frustration. Therein is the rest of the story. So number two of my points of three is this. God's provision leads to deliverance. Look at what happens here in verse 9. Let's pick up with verse 9. Watch this. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. I think God is just saying, I'm still here. I haven't left. You can complain all you want. I'm still here to provide for you. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then, here's why, or how this is going to happen, and what he wants for them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. So in the evening, 
quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the ground. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Now, I envision, probably because I'd like for it to be this, um, kind of the glaze on the Krispy Kreme donut. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm like, for 40 years, I could eat that for 40 years. Um, that would be amazing. Now, it's more than that, it seems. I mean, it's like, like Chick-fil-A. I mean, right? Manna from heaven. I could do that for 40 years. Anybody else? I mean, like, really, that probably wouldn't get old. Did y'all see the Babylon Bee, by the way? Um, a family prayed. They were at McDonald's. They prayed over the meal, and it became Chick-fil-A. Did y'all see that? It's true. True story. Not fake news. I think that happened. So, um, sorry. Wow, I went off track there. Verse 15. I'm getting happy about Krispy Kreme. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? And this is interesting. This is a play on words, manna, they're going to call it. And it's almost like saying, man who? Uh, manna. Man who? Manna. It's like, whatchamacallit? It's an interesting word in the Hebrew. Uh, for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread, so it's like bread, that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as he can eat. Now, here's what's going to happen. He says, you each shall take an omer, which is two liters. We all kind of know what that is, right? Two liter, two, two liter bottle. Think of it. An amount for each person. And so they did so. Some gathered less, some more. And, but they all had exactly what they needed. And when they had all gathered it, there was none left. It was just this perfect amount. All right? Each of you, each of them gathered as much as he could eat. Now, I want you to see that that on the one hand, then, our unmet expectations lead to frustration. But then we see God's provision leads to deliverance over two things. Watch. His, he delivers us from our expectations. And here's what I mean. God provides for them, but not in the way they anticipated. When we, when we complain, again, we're simply revealing we're not trusting that God is going to come through for us. And he does, but not in the way they think he's going to come through. And isn't this all of life? God knows what we need better than we do, so he delivers on a promise, he provides for us, and it frees us from, then, our expectations, our frustration. And that's the next thing I want you to see here. In verses 13 through 18, he provides, and it frees them from not only their expectations, from, from their frustrations. God provides and releases all of us from this frustration, this nostalgia for the past, the fear of the future, we can trust him in the present. Don't you need to do more of that in your day? God provides for us in the present. I love that. He's always the great I am. He's always present tense. He's always right here for you today. So whatever you're frustrated about these days, and maybe you've personified it, sure enough, and I hope you're, you're seeing today, maybe it's not that person in your life. Maybe it's not their problem. Perhaps God is saying, you know what? You need to calm down. You need to trust me. And you need to rest and be content. I am sovereign over your life. I'm at work in your life. And so the, the unmet expectations lead to this, this frustration. God's provision leads to a deliverance. And then thirdly, God's deliverance should lead to obedience. Now watch what happens. And it does, in fact, in the end. But watch what happens. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. He's saying, let's follow God precisely, exactly what he has said. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning. And it bred worms, yikes, and stank. And Moses was angry with them because they did not do what the Lord said. Verse 21. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. This is a really strange kind of food going on here. It's bread from heaven. Verse 22. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest. Now look at this, a holy Sabbath. This is before, by the way, Exodus 20, where we see the commandment to, to, to follow, uh, keep the Sabbath. Bake what you will. So you could bake this, you could boil it, boil what you will, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. 
So on that final, that, that sixth day, they were to collect twice as much so that they would not have to go out on, on the Sabbath day because they would have food left over if they followed his instruction. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it, so it could be preserved for the next day. Moses said, eat it today. For today is the Sabbath of the Lord. Today you will find it in the field. Six days you gather. Seventh, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, see, he's mad again. Why are y'all going out here? You were told not to go out here. And they're going out to look for more. And so he's angry again. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath He's saying you are to rest. And of course, we know the Lord rested on the seventh day of creation. He's telling us to do the same, to trust him is what this is all about. And then the house of the Lord, they called this stuff manna. And it was, then it goes on to describe it. It was like a coriander seed, white and taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Sounds pretty good. And Moses said, this is what the Lord's commanding. And he tells him to take an omer of it, take a bit of it and keep it, put it in a jar and hang on to it so that through the years you can tell your children, your grandchildren, this is how the Lord has provided for us. In fact, it ends up, a bit of it ends up in in the tabernacle. So there's this discipline of, um, there's this discipline of remembrance. And the people, it says in verse 35, ate the manna 40 years till they came to the habitable, uh, habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So I want you to see that God's deliverance here then leads to obedience. Uh, When God provides for us, it's really um, a training ground for our obedience. He delivers us and he says, now that you find yourself one of my children, I want you to trust me. The whole story here is is this question. Are you going to trust me? And this is where I want us to land as we close. Do you trust him? Are you really trusting the Lord? You say, well, how would I know? Well, one, if you're a complainer, constantly whining, negative, that would be a sign. You're not trusting the Lord. If you're content, joyful, optimistic, and people would describe you as such, you're trusting in the Lord. See, as believers, we ought to be the most um, optimistic, joyful people on the planet. Because we know that we have been rescued from slavery. We find ourselves in the wilderness, but we know how the game's going to end. We know we're heading to the promised land. We know that God has got this. And friend, listen, you need to be reminded today, he has you in the palm of his hand. He has not left you. And so the question is, how do you know if you're trusting him? Well, trust looks a lot like obedience. That's what it is. Are you obeying his word? Well, you need to know his word. So it's why we come every, every Sunday to gather in our connect groups. Why we have Bible studies through the week and why you're here today. To hear from the word of God. Obedience marks the person who is trusting in the Lord. In fact, trust is obedience. I'd say this too, though, and we see it in this passage. Trust looks a lot like rest. Trust looks like Sabbath rest. Would that describe your life? Deep, soulful rest. You know, it's been said, Jesus was often busy, but he was never in a hurry. Deep, soulful rest marks the person who trusts in the Lord. God's provision is an unexpected rescue of his people. Think about it. How many people expected God to show up incarnate in the flesh? How many people expected God to come to us in the form of a baby. No one expected him to be born in Bethlehem, to ride a donkey ultimately into Jerusalem. No one expected him to die on Friday and to be raised again on Sunday. No one expected him to be the savior of the world. He came. Our expectations were different. But God shows up with an unexpected rescue of his people. And and not many expect him to come back in the flesh and restore all of creation. He's coming again, friends. 
And he's going to come, and when he comes again, he's going to say, it's closing time. Game over. But many of you who've trusted me and have seen what I have said is going to happen. You know how the game's going to end. But only those who are, are saved, those who've received Christ, if you're in him, you know what this story points us to. In John chapter 6, Jesus is teaching and he's telling the people, listen, uh, your ancestors, your forefathers were out in the wilderness and God brought bread from heaven to provide for them. They ate manna. But then he says, but you know what? They still died. They ultimately died. And then he says, I am the bread of life. The bread that's come down from heaven. And anyone who eats, he says, my flesh and drinks my blood will never die. What's he saying? Anyone who would receive my grace, allow me to come into their heart to forgive them. He says in John 6, chapter, chapter 6, 51, you can see it there. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. God's provision in Christ should change our expectations. Because we know how the game ends. It should impact everything about your life. It should impact every relationship. It should impact your job. It should impact the way that you, that you manage your life and spend your time. It should impact the way you love your spouse, your roommate, or friends. It should, be, it should impact all of life. It should impact the way we, we serve others. We sang it earlier. we got to let our light shine. We're going to love who you love. We're going to serve how you serve. The fact that Christ is the bread of life means that all the love that I need, I have found in him. So I can love you. You can love the most difficult person in your life this week because all the love you need, you have found in him. All the bread you need, you have from him. You don't need more. You can be content. Watch this. You can rest. So we all find ourselves in the wilderness between the already and the not yet. C.S. Lewis said, human history is, is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God to make him happy. Are you content? And if not, it's because we're not pursuing, we're not eating of the bread of Christ that he's already given to us. He alone sustains us. There's a, a new song out by Sandra McCracken. Great album, kind of for the Easter season. And she writes this, If it's not okay, it is not the end. And this is not okay. So I know this is not the end. Friends, if you're struggling in the wilderness today, I would say join the club. But trust the Lord. And obey him. And I want to ask, what does that look like for you today? Jesus is the bread of life. He's the only food that will sustain you. The only one who will fulfill the longings of your heart. But you've got to turn to him. You've got to obey him. And he says, receive my grace. Live in my love. And I want us to pray together as we close our time. And I just want to guide a moment. Um, of prayer. This is the most important time of the message here as we land. This is God has spoken into your heart today through his word. Are you trusting him? I asked earlier, are, are you a complainer? Do you, do you whine way too much? Uh, just confess that to the Lord. And maybe it'd be good to confess it to someone else. Maybe ask the question of someone else. To be honest and look hard at your life because complaining reveals our hearts. It's a matter of trust or lack thereof. And friend, if you're here today and, and you've never received Christ, with your head bowed and eyes closed right now, you've, you, you've not found yourself set free from the stuff of this world. There's a moment in time when you receive Christ as your Savior. He is your salvation. He is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 
If you've never asked him into your heart, you can do so now. You can settle that right now. Say, Lord, come into my life. I confess my sin before you. I give you my life. You are the only one who can satisfy. He alone has gone to the cross for you. He alone has taken upon himself your sin so that you might be set free from slavery and death. Lord Jesus, we give you our lives. And we thank you for the grace that's come to us. And though we find ourselves in the wilderness, thank you for teaching us today that our current circumstances, they don't determine where we're heading. They only determine where we start. May we start with you, our Savior and our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.